Let us pray. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you, O Lord, for another opportunity to preach your word. I pray, O Lord, that you bless the hearing of your word as I preach. Help us to be edified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're in the last part of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're in chapter 7. So two subtopics we're looking at today is the straight gate and the conclusion. The straight gate and the conclusion. So these this ending part of the Sermon on the Mount is very important and foundational, as you can see. Uh, the straight gate and Jesus talking about uh, what the being here as and do as of his word. All right, let's look at verse 13 where we stopped. The straight gate. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So straight is different from straight. Okay, I just said the same thing. It sounds the same. <laughs> but straight without the G-H is different from the straight with the G-H. Now, they have the same pronunciation, uh, but have different spellings, obviously, and different meanings. So, straight without the G-H means a narrow passage of water. Now, it also may mean uh, being in a position of distress or, in, or a position of difficulty in another context. But straight is the gate, as the Bible says, means narrow is the gate. In fact, the Bible explains that in the same passage, same breath, I'll say. So hence, the contrast, wide is the gate. So narrow gate, wide gate. Now, straight GH, on the other hand, also means without bend, without curve. So straight versus crooked. They, they have the same sound, but they have different meanings. And um, yeah, people get confused about that because they think when the Bible says straight, it means like, oh, the gate is straight, it's not narrow, uh, sorry, it's not bending, you know, that's not the message there. So what is the message here? Let's compare both gates, you know, the straight gate and the wide gate. So the similarities, the way to life has a gate. The way to destruction also has a gate. So both of them have gates. Now the difference is the straight gate or uh, straight is the gate that leads to life. That means narrow is the way. But wide is the gate that leads to destruction. That means broad is the way. So it is not about which one is easy and which one is difficult. That's not what. Jesus, that's not the exact. That's not the message that Jesus is talking about here, right? Both of them have gates. Belief is needed to enter both of them, because one is either believing on Jesus and the other one is believing on works. Right? So both of them have gates. What do you believe on that you, that you uh, would choose what gate you enter? Now the New King James says, difficult is the way that leads to life. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about, oh, one is difficult, one is easy. And ESV says, the way is easy that leads to destruction. So if you put two of them together, false Bibles, oh, it's easy to go to destruction and it is hard to go to through the gate of uh, go to life that means get saved it's hard to get saved and it's easy uh, uh, to go to hell now salvation is not difficult so let's just handle that because that as again i said it's not about difficult or easy i'll explain what jesus is trying to say but let's just handle this salvation is not difficult you believe you receive the gift of eternal life and that's it no works by grace through faith so on the other hand the bible says the way of transgressors is hard right <laughs> so that way leading to hell is a hard way living in sin and not having a purpose in life being tossed by every wind of doctrine and being in bondage to sin sin is not a good master right so you can't just say oh it's easy to go to hell uh but it's hard too because that life's a hard life so but on the other hand it's easy to go to heaven <laughs> because you just believe it's not of works but again the life of a believer that is serving the lord it's not a bed of roses. So people mistake the works that God wants us to do, that we should do as the way to go to heaven and say, oh, therefore, that gate is hard. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is teaching that only few will be saved. That is the message here. That only few will be saved. So go with the few. Even though many people are not with you, it might look like, oh, you're just crazy. Just only few of you go to church on Sunday. Only few of you read your Bible. Only few of you believe this way. All the other churches are believing, oh, you have to do good to go to heaven. But just a, a bunch of you believe this way. But it's only few that find that way. That's what Jesus is teaching. No matter how many people are against you, your family is against you. You're going to see that as we go through the Gospels. That 
you put Jesus first, people will be against you, your workers, colleagues, the world will be against you. But don't be afraid. You have the truth. You have the way. It's only a few people that will find it. And this is something the apostles, I believe, learned with Jesus. I mean, they even asked Jesus, is it few that will be saved? And Jesus said pretty much, in other words, yes, only a few will be saved. Now, Paul wants to save everybody, and I'm not faulting him for that. <laughs> you know, he wants to save all Israel. And he tried, or wanted to save all Israel, and he tried and tried. But it's only a few that will find this way. Now, the message is simple. Enter ye in at the straight gate, because few there be that find it. I'm paraphrasing. That's what Jesus is saying. Enter that straight gate, and few there be that find it. And few is relative, by the way. Compared to the world, it's only few. Now, during the time of Jesus, depending on the season, depending on the situation, many people can be saved. So that's why I say few is relative. During the time of Jesus, John the Baptist, the Bible says multitudes were saved. Multitudes got baptized. We're just talking about salvation, not a way of, you know, like a disciple, being a disciple. It's just entering that gate. So few is, uh, is relative. Uh, let's look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets. We're still talking about the straight gate here. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep clo sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So, Many go through the wide gate due to false prophets. Because many people listen to false prophets. Many people listen to the world uh, raise up men. Uh, men that want to make merchandise off of, off of them. So hence, Jesus is warning about the false prophets. Because those are the ones that will lead those people, the many, through the wide gate. So they appear as sheep, but they are voracious predators. That's what Jesus is saying. They are they appear harmless as if they will sacrifice themselves for people, like for, for, for like sheep. You know, sheep is just living a life of sacrifice, uh, basically. You know, the wool, the milk, the flesh, at the end they kill it, and it's food. So throughout his life is just serving and serving and serving, and not ha uh, completely harmless, or almost completely, depending on if it's a male sheep, there's a ram. <laughs> you get my point. You know the picture of the sheep Jesus is talking about. Um, but they are actually the opposite, the, the, the false prophets, the, the ravening wolves. They are actually the opposite. They are wild, carnivorous beasts that seek the very lives of others to survive. How do beasts survive? Uh, survive? The, the wolves. They kill other animals. They don't say, okay, you know, I'll just take a bite of your leg, then we'll move on. <laughs> you know, you heal, come back next year. No. They kill other people to survive, and that's what they're doing. Destroying other people's lives. Now, when Jesus says sheep's clothing, he's talking about their mannerisms. Because they put on this clothing for a while. So they have these mannerisms, it's all well acted out, that they're all holy and good. Their clothing, their speech, you know, very eloquent, all of that. They look like sheep. Only for short periods because it's clothing that will come off. So it's only for short periods, especially when they are in public. But they have a different lifestyle away from the public eye. And if you watch them closely and, and uh, news comes out about them, then you see who they truly are because then that clothing is off. So it's not just about a particular sin. It's, it's not just saying, oh, they have this particular sin and anybody that has this sin, oh, it's wolf. No, it's about the lifestyle that they live. They appear as sheep. They appear that they want to help people, encourage people, and, it, but their beliefs, their lifestyle, completely different because it's going to warn us about these people, how to watch out for them, who they are. So just like movie actors, right? You see an actor in a movie and you're like, oh, he's such a good guy. See how he saved this guy, saved that. But that's not who he is in real life. Right? In real life, they're just wicked people. In fact, while they're acting in the movie, they're like cussing out everybody. And I don't know if you guys know that, but they, they are horrible to work with. But in the movie, oh, they're just rated up as, and people think that that's how they are, but they're just acting. Verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruits, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruits. So, trees are known by their fruits. Uh, not all plants are trees mature enough to have fruits. So, I'm talking about also spiritually. Because spiritually, a babe in Christ is not going to have fruits. 
yet. So the babe has to grow, mature, you know, go deep in the Lord and the Word of God. And he might not have fruits. He might have fruits. You know, it depends. Uh, but it's not all. Um, it's not everybody that has that have fruits. It's not all believers that have fruits, right? And also, it's not all trees. They they have to mature and grow, and in their seasons have fruits. Now, these trees that Jesus talking about is the false prophets. They claim to be teachers. They claim to be edifying all that people. Oh, I'm going to show you the way. I know enough to lead you. Follow me as I follow Christ. So that's what they are claiming. Just as Paul rightfully said, follow me as I follow Christ. So it's a tree. So examine his fruits. So examine their fruits. Those that claim to be trees, as it were. So you also need to know what to look for. Because you're saying examine the fruit, but if you don't know what to look for, how are you going to examine the fruit? Are you going to look for grapes or thorns? Is a question. Because if you're looking for thorns, you would think that a grape tree is bad. Right? Oh, that's, that's a bad tree. Because you're looking for thorns. You don't know what you're looking for. So, if grapes, then don't be looking for grapes at a locust tree. That's a tree that bears thorns, right? So, a thorn producing tree. So, you go to the vine. So you go to trees that, you know, like the vine, you go to the vineyard and be looking for grapes and find, oh yeah, is, and examine the fruits and make sure that you're, getting, uh, th that you're getting the grapes because it looks like a grape tree. This is what I mean. You don't go to a crazy place and expecting to hear, you know, the Bible or hear the, the, the word of God, the truth of the word of God. So, be, because that's what people do. You say, oh, pastor, that doesn't make sense. Who, who will go to a thorn or a locust tree to look for grapes? But people do that because they don't care. They're not thinking of what fruits, right? All they see is church. They see a steeple and they see a cross. <laughs> oh, that's a tree. That's all they see. Oh, let's go there. You know, then we can examine their fruits there, you know, or, or let's just go there because they don't even know what they're looking for. So a non-denominational uh, church, oh, but they have good music. Is that the fruit you're supposed to be looking for? When God says... You know them by their fruits. Oh, the, the music there is wonderful. The, the programs that they have is wonderful. That means you're not looking for, you're not examining the fruits. That is not the fruits. So you first have to know what you're looking for. Salvation. Grace through faith. Right? You have to understand that. Not of works. The Bible. What Bible are they using? You know, a church could be saved, but it's now gone astray. And they're using NIV. That is not the word of God. That is straight off from the pits of hell. That is a perversion, a corruption of the word of God. So um, you have to make sure you're using the right Bible and other doctrines. And I say other doctrines because, you know, as long as you have salvation and the right Bible, you, you most likely have other doctrines right. But there are some doctrines that, you know, to me, just crosses the line. <laughs> like, uh, what do you call that? Um, dispensationalism right dispensationalism uh, and I have a list here so in fact if you have the, the right gospel that is you have the right salvation and you have the right Bible it's easy for soul winning to follow because you know it's easy you know so even if they don't have soul winning in that church you can just you know start up soul winning right and if the pastor has the right gospel and the right Bible it's gonna be easy he's gonna let that soul winning blossom and you can be the one that starts up the soul winning um, I'm just talking in general now, dispensationalism, no matter, it just destroys the doctrines of the Bible and messes and confuses, puts messes up the water, declare waters of salvation. So it muddies up the water. So that's what dispensationalism does. And there are other things. I mean, if the church is wrong on sodomy, they might be saved, but I don't want my kids there. Because I don't want to put my family where predators are there. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I, like, it's just, it's feasting. Then, they, okay, sodomy, then this nursery allowing, not, like, you're just inviting them <laughs> to the church. Oh, yes, but they're saved, but I don't want to take the chances. Then the roles of men and women, that just messes up, you know, the, the family, right? Roles of men and women, or you're allowing fornication, adultery. You know, the first Corinthians chapter 5 sins, if that is just rampant in the church, then where's church discipline? What kind of society or what kind of community am I raising my family in? So those are things you have to think about apart from just grace through faith, thy salvation and the Bible. So I'm just telling you what fruits, like are they saved there, right? That's the first thing. Are they reading the right Bible? That's the second thing, right? So check the fruits. 
So all this comes before the activities of the church. Oh, they go picnic and they go on this and they go on that. Those are not the fruits you should be looking for. All right, verse 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruits. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruits. False religion cannot bring forth believers. It's as simple as that. So you don't go to a mosque looking for uh, good fruits. It, it, you, can, you know, we, we might just find one. You never know. I mean, because God really looks at the heart. <laughs> no, I believe the Bible. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruits and vice versa. So a Pentecostal church, which you believe you have to speak in tongues, you have to get baptized, all of that, before you get saved, and you have to do good works to maintain yourself. There's no good fruit there. It's as simple as that. If when a Jew gets saved, he joins the church and becomes a believer, a saint. Right? They don't call themselves, oh, Jews, Jews no more. They call themselves Christians. In fact, even if they don't want to answer, uh, even if they want to answer Jews, they will be called Christians. <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, Pentecostalism, Muslim, Buddhism, all of that, those are evil trees, those are corrupt trees bringing forth corrupt fruits. Amen? So, you cannot give something that you do not have. And that's what God is, Jesus is trying to teach here. You cannot give something that you don't have. A good tree cannot. It's not that will not or will most likely not. No, can not. Just as God cannot lie. Right? So, or you cannot reproduce something that you are not. I know it, it seems quite easy to understand, but not for uh, people that believe evolution. You say, oh, you cannot reproduce something that you are not. But evolutionists believe that. It's like simple science. You cannot give something you, cannot give something you don't have. You cannot reproduce something that you're not. But they believe that we came from... You know, let me just make it easy. From apes, right? They believe that we came from apes. Like, how, <laughs> how is that possible? It's just simple, you know? <laughs> so, don't mistake, though, like when you're comparing the fruits, don't mistake the tars for the wheat. Don't, don't make that mistake. The Bible says, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So you go to a church or something and you now look for that tar, uh, tar or anything called C T A R E. You look for that tar and that, that's the weed. And you're like, yeah, you see, bad fruits right there. That means, you know, all the weeds here, yeah, they're all evil. No, there will be false prophets among you. In fact, the Bible also says in 1 John 2 19. They went out from, um, from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So, you might find those tears there, or weed, among the crops, among the weeds. Alright, so, who are we talking about? Like, you come to church and you see a visitor with NIV. <laughs> right? you be like, oh, wow, you see, they don't have the right Bible. Because it's all one guy or one family using the NIV. So, all newer church members. So, even if it's not a visitor, he's been attending for two months or so, and he's still using the NIV. Okay? I mean, I'll continue preaching against it, but, you know, that's not what the church uses. Right? You see that? So, it takes time to change. You have to be patient with people. And I've seen us even change. I've seen us in this church change in many stances. i um, not going to mention, but I've seen growth in the church. So it takes time. You have to be patient with people as they come in, as they learn, as they grow. So remember, the fruit is whether you believe the gospel. So don't just, oh, now look at clothing. Oh, look at what person, they wear makeup. Is that the fruit you're supposed to be looking for? <laughs> See what I mean? So lifestyle is the fruit of the spirit. Amen? We're talking about the fruit of the tree, the false prophet. Not if the tree has leaves or is green or how many branches it has or how healthy the tree is. We're looking at the fruits. Amen? <laughs> because if it's not, you know, there are many parables that Jesus, Jesus gave and the, the husband man came. It's like this tree is just having very rich growing but no fruits. So if it's that, people just look at the tree so healthy. But that's just the fruit of the spirit. That's not, that's not your own fruit. Amen? Amen. All right, verse 19, let's move on. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. All right, open to Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 20, verse 19. Deuteronomy 20, 19. And all the envir environmentalists, you might want to close your ears for this one. <laughs> Deuteronomy 20, 19. The Bible says, okay, verse 19, they will like it. 
they just skip verse 20. So 19 says, When thou shalt besiege a city a long time in making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them, and thou shalt not cut them down, for the tree of the field is man's life, to employ them in the siege. Verse 20, now close your eyes. Only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat, thou shalt destroy and cut them down, and thou shalt build bulwarks against the city that maketh war with thee until it be subdued. So bulwarks are defense structures. God is teaching them when they are going for wars, uh, in a siege, how, what they can do with trees. So if it's a tree that is bringing forth fruits, good fruits, don't cut them down. It is your life. You see that? So trees that bring forth fruits is life to those that are there. That's why a believer bringing forth fruits is giving life. Anyway, and the trees that are evil, like when I say evil, they don't bring forth good fruits because a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruits. So that tree, what is it made for? It's meant to be hewn down and cast into the fire, firewood. That means used for other purposes. It's not just supposed to continue taking, I mean, it can continue taking, it's just, it's waiting for a stone to be cut down and be used for firewood. So God is just, uh, or nature is just preserving it for man to use. So everything God created is for man. The animals, yes, it's for man. See, when man sins, the animals still are cursed. You know, everything in the land, the animals are dying. The beasts of the field, they are dying. Uh, God sends down fire to burn down all the trees, burn down. So, oh yeah, let's preserve this. Wildfires burn down trees. See, we have been giving dominion over all his creation, beasts and plants. And guess what? Trees will not finish before the end of the world. It's because people don't believe about uh, believe the Bible. They don't know the Bible. They don't know what God has planned. How do I know the trees will not finish? Because God, during the wrath of God, God is going to burn down a third part of the trees. <laughs> Hello? So we're destroying all the trees by the time in 2030 or in 10 years time, there'll be no more trees. So what is God going to burn down? <laughs> you know, he's, he's going to burn down the trees. So we're not going to be covered with snow or before it was global icing or ice age. Now it's global warming. There'll be no trees. we just going to be a desert. He says all the grass too will be burned down. <laughs> How is that going to happen? So I believe the Bible. Use the trees. Cut down the trees. Use them because they're not bringing for good fruit. Amen? So some people believe though that this is pointing to losing your salvation. Right? Because he's saying you cut down the trees and you uh, put it into fire. First off, trees do not refer to all the people right it's talking about the false prophets the teachers the pastors those that want to be leaders already explained that so hewn down cast into the fire it can symbolically represent hell but not in all instances example yours truly i was a pastor claiming to be a tree and teaching work salvation pentecostalism so what am i supposed to be hewn down and sent into hell <laughs> you know so it's not always picturing hell it's just saying the, the, um, it's, okay, let me put this. It's not a license to condemn people to hell. So once somebody, a preacher, is just preaching the wrong thing, like uh, concerning the gospel, oh, he should be cut down and sent to hell. Uh, just pray that you know he should be cut down and sent to hell or something like that. You know, no, yes, you can curse him, as the Bible says, if somebody comes to the wrong gospel and all of that, let him be accursed, all of that. But. It, if that person is claiming, oh, it's the right way, and you're trying to teach the person, the person doesn't want to change, yeah, after one admonition, the second admonition, then you can do anything, uh, you can, you know, kick him out, all of that. But you should try to help the person, you know, you should, you should try to help the person. And if the person doesn't want to hear, then that's it. So Jesus is saying that the trees with bad fruits should cease to continue. People will use the wood for other purposes, like uh, like firewood. Like the false prophets should not be listened to, should not be afraid, like should not be afraid of them, I should say, should not be followed. Their ministry should be destroyed. The tree should be hewn down by people. That is what in an ideal world is supposed to happen, right? So why is this not happening? Open to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30 verse nine. Because people are supposed to just look at the tree. It's not bringing forth grapes. Like good fruit, I should say. It's bringing forth thorns. It's not bringing out figs. It's bringing out thistles. Like, how does that edify you? But the thing is, as I said, they don't know the fruits to look for. They are not looking for good fruits. In fact, it is worse than that. So, first of all, people don't know the fruit to look for. And they don't even know what the fruit is. 
right? Instead, they are looking for the fruit of the Spirit most times, and they think they are righteous. But the main problem, or another major problem, is that the people want the thorns and they want the thistles. They want the lies and the deception. Isaiah 30, verse 9, the Bible says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. I mean, it can't be any clearer than that. Where they want the wrong things prophesied because that is the lifestyle that they want. That is the choice that they want. They don't want to hear the, the truth. Hence, you have all these false prophets springing up because it's an easy way to make money. <laughs> it's an easy way. You know, no, you, you rarely see a child that would just, like, not from the pastor's family, most likely, but a child just from another family say, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a pastor. <laughs> but after seeing Joe Austin, right, and T.D. Jakes, and, you know, you can name the big guys, Kenneth Copeland them, that have a, a, a airport, a plane hangar in their, in their house, in their garage, <laughs> right? They're like, yeah, if that's what a pastor is, I want to be a pastor. Because then they start springing up everywhere. You have churches everywhere. And that is the way that, is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that find it. See how people uh, get led to the wide gate instead of the straight gate that only few that find it because they have all these preachers that they are heaping to themselves as the Bible says. Look at verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is life. It is through the straight gate. So that is entering the kingdom of heaven. So now God is just saying how to enter that straight gate because let's talk about the straight gate. Lordship salvation, which is not salvation, because salvation is not by, you know, lordship, it's not by uh, obeying all the commandments of, of the law, because by the commandments of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, as the Bible says. So lordship salvation will not get anyone into the straight gate. Open to John 6, John 6, 38. Many will fall for the deception of lordship salvation. Why? Due to pride. Pride is a, is a problem, because there's a saying in this world, Take pride in the work that you do, right? You see that, you know, it's like a motivational saying, you know, work hard and take pride in your work, all of that. I see that in the office place. So, you know, take pride in your work, take pride in your work. So people like to do work, so they got pride in it and they can boast. Like in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, no works, lest any man should boast. See, so where does boasting come from? Pride. What did you have that you never received? So they think that they walked for it and they got it, but that is not salvation because that's not how you get uh, eternal life. So, but it is God's will to do works, you know, obey the commandments. That's what people say. Oh, so you are not supposed to obey the commandments. See, God has not willed that you should obey the commandments. You obey the gospel. You start with that first. That is the first thing that God wants us to obey, and that is by believing. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach here. Say, so how do I know? Look at John 6, 38. The Bible says, For I came down from heaven. So that's why Jesus is here. And that's what he's talking about. I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which had sent me, that of all which he had given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. It's like, what does that mean? Okay, let me rephrase it. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So he explains, it makes it very easy. In case you didn't understand that I will not lose anything or anyone, or nothing, I should say. I will, I will lose nothing. It says, everyone that sees the Son and believeth, will have everlasting life. That means you're not going to be lost and the resurrection, part of the resurrection, right? So this is the will of God concerning entering the straight gate. We're still talking about the straight gate. So don't, don't get carried away. You know? Oh, God does not want us to obey his will and do the commandments. No, you, you, that's a different topic. We're talking about getting into that straight gate. So that is the will Jesus is talking about. Doing works before salvation is dead works. Why? Because they don't have life yet. 
They've not entered the gate. <laughs> the gate that leads to life. The straight gate. In Hebrews 6 verse 1, how do I know it's dead works? Hebrews 6 verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So, it's talking about, we should... Preach other things, right? You should learn other things. You should grow in the word of God. It's not just, every. imagine every Sunday I come, I'm just saying, Bible way to heaven, Bible way to heaven. You're like, <laughs> pastor, like other things, right? Uh, okay, let me not digress. So, Paul is saying that we should grow from these things. And what is that foundation? The foundation of repentance from dead works. That means believing your works to save you, doing the works of the law. Thinking that will save you, or the sacrifices, all of that, or you know, the washings and the kind of ordinary. That is not what saves them. That, that never saved them. It is faith towards God that saved them. So, yet teaching those things, we need to grow from that. He was talking to the Hebrews here. You need to grow from that. So, is dead works. That's what the Bible calls it. Because they're all is if you're not saved, it's works, but it's dead works. Verse 22, back to Matthew chapter 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I prof profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that walk iniquity. Jesus did not deny that they did wonderful works. He didn't say, wait, 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 what works? Were you guys one of the people Thanksgiving you were sharing food? Oh yes, I, I I didn't count that. Sorry. No, he didn't say that, right? He didn't say, oh, did you give? Did you? Did you? Oh. He he didn't deny it, right? They did those things claiming the authority or the power of Jesus. Oh, we're doing this in Jesus' name. We did it in your name, right? Oh, so God is the one that sent us. God has given us the right to do all these good works. Okay. He didn't, he didn't, that's what they were claiming, and they did all those works, and Jesus did not deny that. So, they are teaching, oh, love for one another, oh, love each other, love, 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 love is good, love, love all, love everybody, you know. Or they were even casting out devils. You're like, oh, if they're going to cast out devils, that means, you know, God has stamped his authority and his proof, they must have been saved. Not necessarily, because Jesus did not say, oh, no, 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 you guys didn't cast out devils, though. Right? He didn't say that. The children of the Pharisees casted out devils. Jesus said that to them. So how do your children cast out devils? So some Catholics will also claim to have successfully performed exorcism. Right? Casting out devils. You know? So they will say, oh yeah, didn't we cast out devils in your name? But remember, the Catholic is a corrupt tree. So if the Catholic is believing Catholicism and following the teachings of the Catholic belief, then that is a corrupt tree. Now, there are some believers saved somewhere else by going with their family to a Catholic church. Then, you know, just happens to be a seed that fell among thorns. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. All right. Um, so, feeding the poor, praying for the sick, all these wonderful works, it doesn't mean that they are saved. They are all dead works. And Jesus is not the God of the dead. But the God of the living. So notice also that Jesus will be the one answering them. Because I don't want to digress and I want us to remember this throughout the gospel. In fact, all the gospels. Jesus was coming to the Jews. He came to his own and his own received him not. So he, after this, he's warning them that the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from them. That means as a country, as a, as a nation, right? So it will be given to others, bearing forth the fruits. That, that will bear forth fruit. So it's given to the Gentiles, anybody else. And they took them included. So as a nation, they are going to be rejected. So remember, uh, so Jesus is saying, I will answer them. You know, I will say unto them, I never knew you. So they are expecting to be talking to God here, right? Lord, Lord. Because Lord is the name of God. So, and they call it also a title, Sir, like you know yes sir or something so lord lord in your name i did this in your name i did that so they're talking about in the name of god not oh like necessarily in jesus name it's just in your name like using the name of god so in in your authority i did this i did that so the audience says the jews and the lord is the name that jesus will be answering and look at john 20 john 20 28 i'll read it is what thomas answered when he saw jesus 
Verse 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, that I saw Jesus with the holes in his hands. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So Lord, there is all caps. Because Thomas realizes, Wow, of a truth, Jesus is God. That's what he's, that's what he's pointing out here. Because that is the name of God. That uh, in the, the Old Testament name of God. So, my Lord and my God. And Jesus saith unto him, Oh, don't use the Lord all caps. You know, so that's not what he said. He said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You see that? So, it is Jesus that's going to be answering, He's God. And on that last day, He's going to tell them, I never knew you. Speaking of, I never knew you, open to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. I never knew you shows that they were never saved. Right? You cannot lose your salvation. So it wasn't that, oh, when you guys were doing these good works, you guys were saved, then maybe you stopped doing the good works or these wonderful works. I don't say good works, sorry, dead works. You stopped doing these wonderful works, then you fell into sin, and now, you know, I don't know you anymore. No, he didn't say, I don't know you anymore. He didn't say, I used to know you. No, he said, I never knew you. Jesus knowing us is, is, is symbolical for salvation. It's like a father knows his child. When the child is born, the father sees the child, he knows the child. That is symbolical that way. And we knowing Jesus does not necessarily mean salvation. Because if a random child knows me and knows what I believe and, you know, what I say and what pleases me, doesn't necessarily mean that that child is mine. You see, so people can say, oh, I know Jesus. I know because it's written in the Bible. They, they do the things in the Proverbs. Or even the things written in their hearts doesn't mean that they're children of God. Right? In Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, he's talking to the Galatians, he preached to them, they got saved, but now it's like they are believing a false prophet. Right? Trying to mess them up in their salvation. So he's talking to them and admonishing them, saying, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, whoa, whoa, whoa. You see there, you're like, Whoa, now that you have known God, saying that you're saved. So he, cor- I would say he corrects himself, he's, he kind of explains more. He says, Or rather, unknown of God. Trying to emphasize the point that, oh, now that you are saved, so you know God, but it doesn't mean that you're saved, actually. Now that you are known of God, that means God knows you. So let's keep going. So that's just one I wanted to point out. So, but now, verse 9 again, after that ye have known God, or rather, and known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and brotherly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Why are you going back into your life of sin? You know, when you did not know God, Right? Uh, you were in sin, serving, in bondage to sin. Now that you know God, or rather, unknown of God, now that God knows you, you see, why are you going back into that lifestyle? That's what he's, he's, he's telling them. So he's emphasizing salvation there. All right, let's move on to the next subtopic conclusion. The conclusion, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So Jesus is the rock. Right, and there is symbolism there, and that can be a whole sermon. But I want to focus on the intent of this passage, right? The conclusion here. So, foundations then were built by digging and laying stones. That's how they mainly built their foundations. Uh, they didn't have like a concrete guy come and pour concrete. Anyway, they so laying stones. So they dug down to the bedrock or to a harder surface than just the the ground. And uh, so they dug down there on hard ground to ensure what a stable for the house so that the house can stand and not shift so foundations are essential Bible says if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do 
So what kind of, what foundations? Talk about the word of God. That's the main foundation. You know, we continue to grow on. Uh, salvation, which you get from the word. Uh, the life of a child. I mean, his beliefs, you know, the foundation of a child starts from his beliefs, his life. That's why it's good to have homeschooling and to send them out to be indoctrinated in the world. Then even the church, church is foundational, the foundation of, uh, of, of, you know, the believer. So the church, everything, the foundations of everything is important. For a believer, Jesus is our foundation. First Corinthians chapter 3 says, First Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, the Bible says, uh, concern about our, our foundation, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the cornerstone is the stone that they lay first and they build all the stones around, you know, that stone. Because that stone is supporting the whole foundation to set the mark. So that is the cornerstone. And Jesus is the cornerstone and the foundation, the, pro the apostles and the prophets. He's still talking about the word of God. God used them to explain, uh, to give his word. So, sand, on the other hand, is not a stable foundation. It's not stable. It shifts easily and erodes with water and wind, which is what Jesus mentioned. When the floods come, when the waters come, and when the winds blow against it. So, water and wind. So, sand conforms to the pattern of wind. And what do we know about wind in the Bible? False doctrines. You know, easily tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So that's false doctrine. Then water. When there's a flood of water, you know, when there's a body of water, is you know, the seas. And that refers to the world, the people, you know, as the nations. And so that means they, are, they conform to, they flow with the masses. They go with the people. So if you build your, your house on what people think, you know, flow with the next trend, you know, with the world, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and your house is going to fall because it doesn't have a stable foundation. People are easily tossed to and fro. Oh, it's Baal, it's Baal. Oh, fire came down, it's God, it's God. You know, like, it's just this guy. And they don't, they don't stay in one place, right? They don't, they're not stable. Jesus mainly is pointing about, he's talking about hearing and doing. That is what makes one prosper. That is what makes one stable. That is the foundation to build upon. When a good foundation is hearing, and not just hearing, but also doing. Open to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verse 22, the Bible says, James 1, 22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholded himself, and goeth his way, and straightforward forgetted what manner of man he was. And also looking into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. See that? So, imagine looking at a mirror and forgetting how you look. Or, first of all, when you look at a mirror, you adjust something. It's just natural. <laughs> Even if you adjust something, you readjust it. You just confirm, you know. All right. You, know, you, you just adjust something. <laughs> Unless you're just passing by. Now, if you overdo it, then something's wrong with you, obviously. <laughs> um, so, when you look at the mirror, you tend to, we tend to adjust something. That's looking at the wo word of God. You can't just say, oh, I've seen myself before I know how I look. No, right? We're supposed to put on that new man, right? So, when you, when you dress up, you put on a new man every day, right? You wake up, you put on a new man. Because you can't say, oh, I put him on last week. <laughs> it doesn't work like that with your clothes, I hope. <laughs> so, you know, you put on a new man every day, and when you put on a new man, look at that word of God, and you adjust it. You adjust yourself. So, anyway, I'm digressing. The point is, looking at yourself and just forgetting how you look, what, what you're wearing, you just completely forgetting, that is absurd. That is, that, that is not normal. So that person is foolish or he wasn't attentive. I mean, it's just not normal. And that's what God is saying. For someone that hears the word of God, you hear something so powerful, you understand it. That's what, you know, hearing is. You understand it and you see how it applies in your life and you just don't do it. That's like looking at yourself in the mirror and just forgetting how you look like. 
So it, it's, it's not wise, it shouldn't be normal. But if you do it, that is if you do all the work, right, then you will be blessed in your deed. Then you will prosper. You see that? So hearing and doing is what makes one mature. That means you're now, you can now build your house, right? In Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12. Because you can hear and hear and hear, and you think, oh, I'm a great Christian. I'm so mature. I, you know, I know I can quote everything, you know. Can you, can you list the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit? Oh, no, you can't. You see, I can list it. You see, so I'm a mature Christian. Doesn't mean you can't. It doesn't mean you're a mature Christian because you know it. It's doing it. How about patience? You know, the long suffering there. You know, can you do long suffering? <laughs> do you have long suffering? Because you know about it, it doesn't mean that you, uh, um, you're mature. The Bible says in Hebrews 5 12, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use. So you have the knowledge, right? Using it, then you're mature enough to for strong meat. So that's maturity. Let me read that again. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See that? Judging. We, 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 chapter 7 started off with judging. Discerning good and evil. I'm able to, you've practiced it, you have skill in it, then you can judge what is right and what is wrong. And so that's what uh, using the word of God, not just being a hearer only, but also a doer of the word. Look at verse 28. Let's move on. Matthew chapter 7, 28. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I, I like that. I mean, end of my read is like, it's like a diss on the scribes. But hey, it's a rightful diss. I mean, it's, it's the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit I saying this. Because the scribes, these are just teachers that, you know, teaching the word of God uh, as... As if someone wrote down, um, like a uh, how, how do I put it? Sunday school manual, and they're just reading it and just talking. No authority. They don't believe what they're saying. That's why you hear some people say, "Oh, if the guy is shouting, why is he shouting? Why can't he just talk? Right? He, must he shout? Are they deaf there? Right? So the Bible says, shout." Raise up your voice, increase your voice, shout, make your voice like a trumpet. Amen. Right? So that's what the Bible says. But they're like, oh, why is he shouting? God wants us to shout. You know? Because they have this lapel mic and all of that. They increase the volume. That's how people can hear them in their auditoriums of 30,000. Imagine if there was no mic, how would they have those 30,000? Right? How would they hear? So, first of all, you're supposed to shout. But it's not just shouting because I want people to hear, right? But it's because you believe what you're saying. It's just, <laughs> it's just what, it, I mean, it's the person, it's the, one person is preaching because he believes what he's saying, and these people are preaching because they don't have authority, they don't really believe it, you know, they're still arguing with the Sadducees, who, if there's a resurrection, but they all, you know, like, if you believe what you're saying, you stand on what you're saying, you have the, the, the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, then God will give you utterance and boldness, and that is something that they lacked. The scribes and uh, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> so let's go back to verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus ended saying, We were astonished at his doctrine. So the power is in the word of God. That's where the power is. They were astonished at what he was saying. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So, uh, the word of God, that is where the power is. The miracles were a vehicle to, for them to listen to the doctrines. You know? And when Jesus did the miracles, it was also out of love and compassion. For example, he was just walking down the street, going, walking with his disciples, and there was a funeral going on. Yes, it was it's for edification, but out of compassion, right? Jesus, just from, out of compassion, he saw them crying. He just rose the guy up, and that was it. <laughs> you know, he just, he's God. He loves us. 
right? And he wants to help us. He wants to save us. He wa- so just, he was just doing miracles. He loved them. But he said, if you don't believe me, believe me for my work's sake. That's what he said. So the miracles, for the, which good work have I done that you're, you know, criticizing me for, paraphrasing. So, but it was for them to listen to the doctrines. Also, the, uh, the miracles were, was proof that the doctrines were true. That what he's saying is true. Because, I mean, look at this, the miracles he was doing. It opened to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 6. As you open it, I'll read you John 7. John 7, 31. The people said, And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man had done? So Jesus did all these miracles. I mean, healing people, everyone, not one was spared. So he did all these miracles. And they're like, if the Messiah comes, what more would the Messiah do? It's not like, oh, Jesus couldn't do this though. No, he healed everybody. Rose the de- uh, raised the dead. Healed everybody. So, would the Messiah do more than this? So this was proof that what he was saying is true. But here's the key thing. The miracles don't just change anybody. They have to accept the doctrine. Do you see that? Acts chapter 13. Look at verse 6. Acts chapter 13, verse 6. The story of Paul. I think it's in the story here, so I'll just read on. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose surname was Bar Jesus, which was uh, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpre- interpretation, which stood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Beware of false prophets, right? Then Saul, who is called, who is also Paul, or who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, "O fool of uh, subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Do you see that? This is a great miracle that happened. I mean, somebody was just trying to disturb and interrupt, and he just put caused blindness on him. And the guy saw what happened. He wasn't astonished at that. What, what was he astonished at? He was astonished at the doctrine. Because the power is in the word of God. Many people will be astonished. Oh, wow, he made him blind. Oh, you know, because they are seeking for signs. Wicked and adulterous generation, they are looking for signs. You know, you show me a sign, show me a sign. But this guy, remember what the Bible says in Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For who? To everyone that believe it. The one that believe it, that power, the power is in the word of God. It's not just the miracles or the signs. So he was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Look at John 6. Uh, do we have time? Okay, we don't have time. So, but in John chapter 6, verse 26 to 42, because these people, they're they astonished at the, the doctrine of God, or, or of Jesus, after he preached the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, the Bible doesn't say that he did miracles or anything. But people, in general, they, they want... They, they want the flesh. What the flesh wants is miracles and the, the good that they can get from Jesus. So in John chapter 6, a long passage from verse 26 to 42, I wanted to read. Uh, this is after Jesus did the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. And these people were just following Jesus about because Jesus was going to give them bread. <laughs> right? And Jesus said, labor not for, uh, for bread. You know, labor not for that in the flesh. Instead, labor for things of eternal value and that is going to heaven and they thought it was by works and he explained it's not by works but my point is it's like let's open there let's i don't want to paraphrase <laughs> it's like i'm not get to, getting to the point uh i apologize john chapter 6 look at verse 26 i'm going to read 
John 6 verse 26. The Bible says, And Jesus answered them and said, Very, very, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him had God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might walk the works of God? And Jesus answered unto them, and Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he had sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign shewest thou then that we may see? So Jesus just finished explaining how to get eternal life. But they just skipped it as if, you know, he didn't say anything. Right? And they asked him for a sign. Right? So what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What, uh, what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Just is redirecting them back to everlasting life. See that? For the bread of heaven, sorry, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. <laughs> They're expecting no more bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which had sent me, that of all which he had given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Pause. Jesus said all of that. See that powerful passage. All of that. Explaining the bread of heaven. Explaining how to, how to have everlasting life. All they heard was that Jesus said, I'm the bread of heaven. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. We're expecting bread. And all you're mad at, all you heard, after everything Jesus said, is that, oh, he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. So what? Are we going to eat you? <laughs> you see, all they were thinking about is the flesh because they believed him not. The power was not in the word of God. It's not what he was saying. All they were looking for was the signs, the miracles, something that will feed their flesh. And all they were listening for is, how can we get bread? <laughs> That's all they were listening for. Listening for. And that was sad. And Jesus, Jesus saw that. That was open. Verse 42. And they said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? Like, you see, so wait, wait. When they were eating the bread, you know, the feeding of 5,000, when they were eating the bread that first time, weren't they thinking, wait, 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 is, this, is it not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? They didn't think about that then. You see that when the miracles were happening, they were not doubting, oh, Jesus is powerful. He was a powerful prophet, doing miracles, all, because that's all they wanted. But when they give them, when they're giving eter things of eternal value, you know, then who is this Jesus? The guy that's giving you, feeding you uh, 5,000 men with bread, <laughs> you don't believe what he's saying? Then something's really wrong with you. Do you see that? So um, that's where we're going to stop, the end of chapter 7. So the Sermon of the Mount. So it's up to the people. Would they hear? Would they just be hearers? Or would you be hearers and doers of what Jesus says? And this is foundation to what Je you know, he goes on his ministry, teaching and doing miracles and doing great and mighty things. Uh, let's bow our heads.